Ten and one, baby. Ten and one, and it feels so good. Let me just revel in this for a minute, please. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, let's talk about Texas coming out with a victory in Ames in the dark against Iowa State 26 to 16 to move to 10 and one on the season, seven and one in the conference, uh, taking a stranglehold on that first place spot in the Big 12. While we didn't clinch our spot in the Big 12 title with the win over Iowa State due to some technicalities, um, the writing on the wall says Texas is essentially in to the Big 12 championship. All we gotta do, take care of business against Texas State. We head into the Big 12 championship. College football playoff hopes still alive, very much so. Let's go ahead and get started. I want to talk about some of the negatives of this game first because quite frankly, there were not very many of them. And I think just get that out of the way so we can go ahead and get onto the good and talk about all the good things that Texas did in this game, right? Negatives, penalties. Uh, penalties cost us a minimum of two touchdowns in this game, right? The long touchdown to Adonai Mitchell, which was an incredible throw and incredible rollout and even more absolutely astonishing catch a one-handed catch, tippy-toe in the back of the end zone to Adonai Mitchell, gets called back for a holding on Kelvin Banks, which quite frankly was complete bullshit. The Big 12 is out to get us this year. They, we, We've seen it all season long. The refereeing has been absolutely abysmal. Um, they've been moving up high school referees to come in ref for Texas games so that way they can pay them off, pay them good, you know, get them to do what they need them to do, try and give Texas the loss so they can shut up and send them on their way. When you got a team as good as Texas, that kind of shit ain't gonna work, man. Even though in these Big 12 games, the calls have 100% been swayed against us. I don't even think at this point, it's not even a conspiracy, it's obvious, right? Um, despite the penalties that we had, Texas played an overall really good game. We had that one taken back, we had the punt return for a touchdown by Xavier Worthy taken back, and then, the turnover by Xavier Worthy on the sweep, which was an excellent reverse uh, reverse play call by Sark. Xavier Worthy fumbles at the six yard line. Likely, at the rate that we were playing, it was going to be another six points, right? I mean, to be just 100% honest, we didn't have any problems moving the, ball, moving the ball against Iowa State. Whether it was on the ground, whether it was through the air, didn't matter. Iowa State could not stop us offensively. Quinn has 300 yards passing. CJ Baxter has 100, over 100 yards rushing. He ran incredible. He ran hard. He ran with uh, with determination. And in a week where everybody was really doubting whether we were going to be able to pick up the slack of where Jonathan Brooks left off, um, now that we're not going to have him for the season, CJ Baxter kind of said, "Listen." I was a starter at the beginning of the season for a reason. Now I'm healthy and I'm gonna show you what I can do. And he he ran excellent. Uh, I think he gave us a glimpse into the future of a future Doak Walker Award, you know, at least finalist in CJ Baxter. Especially if the O-line can continue to improve and we get a little bit better blocking out of them as the season progresses, as the as the future progresses, right? When, when we're talking about next year, talking about these new O-linemen coming in, gonna get better, whatever. That's down the line. CJ Baxter had a great game. Jaden Blue closing out the game on fourth and one in a in a situation where we're terrible on third and fourth and short all season long we have been there's a minute and what 40 seconds left in the game fourth and one and instead of start kicking the field goal going up 29 to 16 or whatever he said nope get a ball to Jaden Blue and let this man go and get the first down and he powered his way for a first down there's a lot of things not only on the field that was done really well but psychologically and in the game planning by sark that was like it, it's little things like this right football football is america's war of attrition it's america's war game right and little things like that psychological advantages while they seem stupid and uh, or they seem uh, insignificant just little things can completely change the attitude of your football team for instance uh sark said after the game that he was very intentional in sending Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat out as captains into the middle of the field. Why? He said, because I want them to see the size. I want them to see who it is that they were talking that shit about. Who it is that they're trying to cash that check in against. <laughs> Hello, nine yards rushing, total. Yeah, that check bounced, baby. You wrote a check and it bounced hard, man. 
that's a lesson. Let that be a lesson to the young kids. Do not run your mouth if you cannot back it up. And let's just be real. The D-line whipped the shit out of Iowa State's O-line all game long. It was not even a competition. The, the, only, the only complaint that we can have about our defense outside of the busted play for the big, you know, like 60-yard touchdown or whatever is the fact that PK still has our corners playing off 10 yards on 3rd and 8 or has them playing off 7 yards on 4th and 3 or 3rd and 3. Like, the shit is... If there's one thing in this season that makes my blood boil more than anything, it is the... It's the insanity of the defensive play calling at times. The insanity, pure insanity. Because why the, why are you going to continue to do the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over for 10 games, 11 games? Why do we continue to play 10 to 12 yards off the ball on third and medium or third and long to go? It just... I just can't. I can't deal with that shit. That's the one complaint I have defensively, and it's not on the players. That's on coaching, right? Outside of that, I thought our defense played absolutely excellent football. They were extremely disciplined. Outside of the slant routes that were getting caught time and time again that were literally giving me a damn aneurysm because everybody, at least I, maybe everybody didn't know it was coming, but it's like, bro, I see the alignment. If I'm Iowa State, and I'm looking at the alignment, and I'm seeing the corners playing five, six yards off the ball on third and four, third and five. Why wouldn't I run a slant? Like, it's so easy. Pitch and catch. And Rocco Beck was doing a great job of, of just catching the ball and throwing the slant and completing it. Picking up 12 to 15 yards every damn time. It was maddening. It was maddening to watch. I did think that PK for, uh, for a majority of the game did a good job being aggressive, though. So, now that we got the bad shit out of the way, let's talk about the good things. We did play aggressive football a lot of times. We did get the corners up to the line of scrimmage. And the only thing I would say about that that we didn't do well is putting hands on the receivers. We were getting up to the line of scrimmage, but literally just giving them free releases and trying to mirror their routes. And that's why we were getting beat on slant routes constantly. Um, you know, outside of... Some offensive PIs that were not called, again, because just penalties were not called for Texas when they should have been. Um, and maybe outside of some holding calls that weren't called, we, we had, what, like three or four sacks on the game, and Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy probably could have had like two or three more each if they weren't being held religiously throughout this game and allowing it to be passed on by the, by the refs. I'm going to leave the refs alone. I'm going to let it go. It is what it is. We still got the dub. So, fuck them. <laughs> I thought defensively, the corners played excellent. The safeties played very, very good football. Jalen Catalan, we only saw Jalen Catalan for a couple of series, which was, I don't know, weird to me. I still think, even though uh, the safeties overall had a good game, we're still rotating way too damn much at the safety position, in my opinion. King Crawford and Michael Taft still shouldn't be out there on the field together, period. King Crawford really shouldn't be out at safety at all. I don't care. Like, he shouldn't be out on, on the field at safety. He's not a safety, right? Just leave him where he is. Make him the gunner. Make him your special team specialist. He, he can go play in the NFL doing that. He don't need to be on the field playing safety because he sucks at it, okay? Jaron Thompson obviously had his incredible interception. The instincts on that play were what I loved the most. We've seen this from Jaron Thompson several times throughout the season. It's just that a lot of times Jaron Thompson is either late or he's got bad eyes or he's just slow, right? Like he's just slow down the field. But when Jaron Thompson can drive on a football and he can make an instinctual play, the kid is a baller. I mean, he can he can really dissect a, a defense. He can dissect an offense very well. And that that break that he made on the ball to intercept that pass at that point in the game, I believe we were up fifteen to nine. After just uh, blocking the extra point on the bus to play, which would have put Iowa State, you know, 13 to 10 right there with us. And instead, it makes it 15 to 9 because we blocked it and returned it all the way for the two point conversion. That was huge. And then to go and get the interception right after was incredible. We did a great job of controlling the game through and through. Um, and I thought the defense did a great job of just keeping everything in front of them. They didn't really get beat deep. 
There was a couple a couple plays here and there, you know, but that's going to happen. Rocco Beck made a, a few really good throws. Again, like what I was saying in the preview, if you go back and look at Rocco Beck, from the beginning of the season, obviously he's just a freshman, right? He's going to make his mistakes, and he did. He made his mistakes. He's also going to make really good plays because he's he's got a good skill set. I mean, the guy, he's he's fairly mobile, fairly. He's got a really good arm, and he's not afraid to make throws. He doesn't question himself, right? He just throws the ball. And he made some really good throws doing that. But at the end of the day, like I predicted, they just don't have the talent. They don't have the they don't have the number of talented players across the board to compete. And that that is really what came to light, in my opinion, towards down the stretch of the game. You could just see that our talent was just it was starting to overwhelm Iowa State. And while the score was close, 26 to 16, um, again, two touchdowns called back. One potential touchdown where Xavier Worthy fumbles. So that is potentially 21 points off the board. Going into the halftime, it would have been 24 to 3. Instead, it was only 6 to 3. We could have put 40 points up on this team easily. Um, it, I'm about to go back and watch the game again right now. Um, but just, just from a, a first thoughts perspective, we did not have any problems moving the ball. Whether it be on the ground or through the air, Quinn looked really good. He continues every single game I see him play, and every time he gets a little bit healthier, watching him throw a football is just, like, it, like, I can't explain it any other way than it's like poetry in motion, watching him play quarterback sometimes. It is the effortlessness that he throws a football, the effortlessness with which he can accurately place a football Anywhere on the field, whether it's a deep sideline throw, whether it's right over the middle, whether he's on the run and got to flick his wrist, whether he's on the run and has got to flick his wrist 35 yards downfield for a complete dime to the back of the end zone where Adonai Mitchell drags his feet, makes a one-handed catch, and then it gets called back for a bullshit-ass penalty. No matter what you ask of him, the kid makes every gosh damn throw on the planet. And it is, it is incredible to see. I can't wait for Quinn to have a full, healthy season. If Quinn can just get a little bit more sturdy, if he can if he can shore up them shoulders and that collarbone put a little more weight on him, maybe the sky is literally the limit for this kid. I, watching him watching him throw a football is is like something I just I haven't I haven't seen like in real time. I honestly haven't seen it in real time. And I know you're like oh, you haven't seen it. Look at Patrick Mahomes and look at Josh Allen and look at uh, uh. no, bro. It's different. It is different. Like. And if you don't understand the difference, you don't watch football. Like, you don't watch football if you don't understand the difference. And that's why every time he's on the field, I, I like, I'm on the edge of my seat when, when Quinn has the ball in his hands because I just know he can make any throw, every throw, all the time if he just lets the damn ball go. When he's not trying to place a ball, when he's just throwing, when he's just using his instincts, using his eyes and just throwing the football, there's no better quarterback Throwing a football in college football. I don't care who it is. It ain't Caleb Williams. It ain't Michael Penix. It ain't Bo Nix. It ain't Jaden Daniels. It's none of them motherfuckers, man. Quinn Ewers, hands down, has the best throw in all of college football. Argue with your mama. I don't care. Go do it. Whatever. Leave me alone. This was a great game. This was a great game all around. When you talk about mental intensity, when you talk about physicality, when you talk about being dialed in, when you talk about focus, through and through, from start to finish, this game was completely controlled by Texas, offensively and defensively. I didn't think there was any position group where you you saw them and you were like, and eh, they really could have had a better game, and they could have done this and that better, and this was the reason why we didn't do this, that, and the other. Like we've done in other games, like well, like we've seen in other games. Uh, this is the reason why the team started coming back. No, they didn't even allow a comeback to happen. They didn't allow a comeback to happen. They had the one big play, and from then on, the game was shut down. And the game was controlled offensively, and when the defense got on the field, Iowa State's offense could do nothing. It was, it was a great all-around performance. I'm really happy about it. Uh, again, I got to go back and really take a deeper dive into it. But just from what I saw, just from a first reaction standpoint, there's nothing to be upset about. We are 10 and 1. We are 10 and 1. 13 years of complete mediocrity. 
in 13 years of disappointment and 13 years of saying this could be a team that plays really well this could be a team that's really good this on paper this on paper the roster is this the roster is five star this and five star that and finally like what sark said when five star players and five star culture converge and they meet and they collide look at what you get it is beautiful to watch there's a lot of things and a lot of teams around the country that can have a lot of complaints about a lot of different things about their team. Look at AM. You got all these five stars. You got all this money. You got all this what? Jimbo Fisher, never seen a 10 win season. You're out the door. Lincoln Riley got a Heisman winner, literally. Got all this talent. Brendan Rice, Marshawn Lloyd, Zachariah Branch, yada, 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 XYZ, and they're seven and five. You know what I'm saying, man? Like, Really take the time as a Texas fan to step back and just smell the roses. And these roses don't smell like shit. And they're just, they're getting better. And we're blooming. We're coming down this stretch of the final games of the season. And we're still getting better. Like, we're still getting better. We got two games left. Two games and everything that they have worked their asses off for for the last three years is right in front of them. One game and then you got the Big 12 Championship at minimum. Like what Jay Witt said, before I get out of here, actually, I I just talked about, I just reminded myself about this. Jordan Whittington is criminally, criminally, criminally overlooked and underrated as a player in this, not, not only in this offense, but across the country. Go look at Jordan Whittington's film since he's been in Texas. Go look at every time that kid steps onto a field, every time he's in a one-on-one -on -one matchup, every time there's a critical play that needs converting, Jordan Whittington is open on the field. I mean, he's open like 7-Eleven, man. 24-7, bro. Jordan Whittington, when scouts and when NFL recruits go back and they watch his film, they are going to be absolutely bamboozled at how often Jordan Whittington is open and how few times the ball is delivered to him. He could have had three touchdowns in this game against Iowa State. Like, it is crazy how good this man is. Y'all don't, y'all may not believe me, go back and watch the film. I'm not gonna explain myself. I know what I see, and what I see out of Jordan Winnington is nothing short of incredible. Like, the kid is so damn good. And that just speaks to the amount of talent we got at Texas, right? Like, when you have somebody like that who, could easily be having seven to 10 catches a game and is only getting one or two maybe every other game. His first touchdown he caught was this week. Like that's insane. That is insane. Jordan Whittington, when you talk about MVP of a team, he's the first person that comes to my head. He's the first person. He does everything, whether it's in special teams, whether it's run blocking, whether it's catching the ball, pass blocking, doesn't matter. Anything you ask Jay Wood to do, he does, and he does that at a very high level. And there were several plays in this game that were massively critical that he converted and he was able to make. And I for I am one person that has massive, massive appreciation for Jay Witt. And we're really gonna miss him when he's gone, man. That's that's somebody that we're really gonna miss. This is, a, this is a special team, man. This is a special Longhorns team, and we have two more games to make this season something that we haven't seen in a decade. Something I haven't seen literally since before I was in high school, man. Like, it's insane. My freshman year of high school was the last time Texas was even sniffing a conference championship or a, a, title, a title game berth. Like, it feels good. I have no complaints. I'm gonna get back in and I'm gonna go and really take a deep dive into this game. And you know what? I'll probably bring y'all along with me as a matter of fact. I think we'll go ahead and do a, a second watch of this game and really point out the good, the bad, and the ugly of the game and just see where this team has improved as the weeks have gone on, right? I think I wanna take y'all on that journey with me so that way you're seeing exactly what I'm seeing and maybe you gain some appreciation for what we're doing, right? If, if and I think that a lot of Texas fans really do appreciate this team and appreciate the season that we're having, especially the ones that have been around for the long haul, right? Uh, myself included. But if you are one of those people who are just like, 
Yeah, they're doing okay, but like they continue to win close games. A win is a win is a win, and what they're doing is something they haven't done in over a decade. So I could I could really care less. Texas beats Iowa State 26 to 16. We're getting ready for the Red Raiders, man. Final game of the season. I can't believe it. I cannot believe this is already the final game of the regular season. It is really insane to me. Uh, this this football season has gone by so fast. And look, when you're winning and you're doing great things, that's what's gonna happen. Texas Tech. Hey, we all know. Big 12 runs through Lubbock, baby. <laughs> Two weeks in a row now, we're going to have billboard material. And it's been just fed to us. And this has been fed to us since last year, before the, even, the, before the season even started, right? Big 12 runs through Lubbock. And guess what? Just like Iowa State had to find out, Tech, y'all going to have to find out, man. It, I have a feeling it ain't going to be pretty. We're going to get out of the Big 12 on the loudest note. We possibly can. I would not be surprised if Texas tries to put up 40 to 50. If, if, if Steve just goes absolutely crazy and says, fuck you, fuck the Big 12 commissioner, fuck the Big 12, fuck all of y'all, we're going out with a bang. Maybe we even put up 60, man. Because I'm going to tell you, no team, not even Alabama, has been able to shut down Steve Sarkeesian's offense when it is full throttle going. And I guarantee you Tech ain't going to be able to do it. It's gonna be get, it's gonna get ugly out there, man. And I can't I really can't wait to dissect this game. I can't wait to get into the into the to the tech analysis because we're gonna pick them apart. We are going to pick them apart. And when it comes game day, y'all are gonna understand why there is no doubt in my mind we're gonna get out of the Big 12 with a bang. If y'all enjoyed the video, please do me a favor. Subscribe to the channel so you never miss anything we got going for you. Smack that like button so we can get the message spread out to the YouTube verse, out to the college football world. And of course, turn on those notification bells. Because remember, no matter where you look, there's no better place than more better sports for your latest football takes. I am Antonio, aka Mr. Mo Better, and I am out. Peace and hook 'em. 10 and 1, baby. Let's go.